So, coach, so coach um, just what are your thoughts on heading into the season and just looking at the team that you currently have right now? Well, we've only had one practice. Um, you know, clearly uh, with the new NCAA rules and allowing us to be together more in the off season, you know, four hours as opposed to two. It's a big difference, uh, which has been a great addition for our program because of uh, so much change and so many new faces. I think the familiarity that we were able to build over the summer is helpful when you lose as many as we've lost player-wise. And uh, I think, you know, again, with so many different players, even the returners, they have a different role this year. And uh, because of that, I think the access we had over the summer uh, has, has been helpful. But, you know, we have a long way to go. Every, every team does at this time of year. But in our case, I think maybe even a little further, again, just because of so much wholesale change, it's, it's something that it, I have not experienced. And it's, it's kind of like almost taking over a, a new program. How have you personally navigated that change? Be more specific. With the players and with just, like you said, you've never experienced something like this. So how have you personally dealt with it and navigated those waters? You know, it's a work in progress. Um, you know, we, we believe in, in the things that we do. And, uh, you know, we had a summer program that I think we really tried to take advantage of uh, the, the more access and the time that we're able to spend together with our guys. Um, and we went from there. You're, you sit here and you say, oh, we embrace these high expectations in Arizona. This year, the expectations are a little bit different. How do you feel about having different expectations this year? No, they are, and rightfully so. Um, but, you know, it's up to us to be better than maybe people on the outside uh, predict us to be. Uh, we're going to work very hard, and uh, I think we have a unique combination of new players because not everybody that's joined us is a freshman. You know, I think in Ryan Luther's case, you know, he's played in the ACC. He's played for some excellent coaches. Uh, the only reason that he's with us is because he got injured last year. And uh, if he wouldn't have gotten injured, he was, he was potentially on his way to being an all-conference player. He was averaging a double-double at the time. But, you know, when you're around someone like Ryan, you understand that he's not 18 years old, that he's been through uh, practices. He's uh, received criticism. He's been coached. You know, he's seen the, the highs and the lows of college sports. And that will be helpful. You know, sometimes Chase Jeter is the forgotten man for us because he's, uh, he's not a new player. He was here a year ago, but yet he didn't play. But again, you remember Chase was a uh, high school All-American and uh, went to Duke, certainly played again in, in the ACC. He was in great practices, had some teammates who are, are playing in the NBA today. And uh, last year he practiced with us every day. But again, like Ryan, Chase isn't a young player, and he's very mature. He's going to graduate at Christmas. And I think he brings, although a new face, uh, he brings a maturity that we really need. And, and I would say the third player, Justin Coleman, I would put in their category as well. You know, Justin started his career at Alabama, and his family had uh, a, a situation that really required him to make the transfer. He got his college degree. And uh, somebody who's played in the SEC, who's obviously an excellent player last year at Sanford. Um, I think, you, you know, when you're around Justin, whether it be in practice or just uh, being around him, I think there's a leadership component and an experience component that, that those three guys bring together, which is unique because usually when you think of new talent or new players, you think of youth. And um, hopefully their experience will be, will be offset. We... Uh, we named Chase Jeter and Justin Coleman captains. And um, that was voted on by both our team and staff. And, and um, again, they received the votes because of what I just said. Uh, they've earned it. And uh, I think you know, that's something that we're looking forward to, their experience. How do you describe Justin's skill set? You know, I would say along the lines of Parker in that he's a small point guard. Um, he's a pass-first point guard. He has a great knack of, of making his teammates better. Um, he's had big scoring nights. Some of the games, especially when he was very young at Alabama, playing against Oregon, playing against Arkansas, I think he had games of maybe the high 20s. 
And uh, he's a capable scorer, but he's more of the, uh, what I would call the true throwback point guard and that he's a run the team guy and somebody who thinks pass before shoot. The returning players having different roles. Who do you uh, foresee of the returning players having the biggest role on the team or being a go-to guy? Yeah, so, you know, I, a lot of times, uh, and this, this really happened in the transition when I first came here um, from our first season to our second, it wasn't necessarily the new faces that impacted our success. It was more the returning players growing, improving, and being much more ready as sophomores than maybe they would have been as freshmen. Um, but each of them, in their own right, I think will return more confident, bigger, stronger, obviously more experienced. You know, I, I don't know if I can really name one from the group, but you know, from your freshman year to your sophomore year, my experience is that many times that's the biggest jump a player can make. And you know, we have a several that are in that in that boat um, you know starting with Brandon Randolph you know Brandon uh, has a lot of talent Uh, Alex Barcelo would be the last member of that class. And, you know, Alex uh, right now is our team's best shooter. Um, you know, I mentioned Brandon Randolph. Certainly Brandon can shoot the ball. But Alex statistically in the drills that we've done really all summer and this year, unlike a year ago, we'll play Alex both on the ball at the one but also uh, off the ball where he could play with maybe one or two guards. Did you have to have empathy for Ira Lee, and how much did you have to discipline him with the situation that happened this summer? You know, college, I have three sons. Um, you know, you want them to be perfect. You want them to leave your home and make great decisions every day of their life. Uh, unfortunately, that's not how it works all the time. Uh, my experience is uh, sometimes the best kids in the world, guys that you uh, you love, you love it when they come over your house, you trust them. They can make a single bad decision. Uh, in Iris' case, you know, he had a lot going on and still does in, in his life. And there's a lot of young people that wouldn't be able to persevere and handle everything that he's experienced over the last three or four months. So um, to answer your question, it's so much about helping him get through this and supporting him. And uh, he's learned you know, how hard it is to make a bad decision. And uh, my hope is that we can, we can get him through this very difficult time. But no question, he's a young person that's been hit with more in the last three or four months than a lot of people are, are going to be hit with in their entire lifetime. Do you have to discipline him at all and within the program on top of what he may go through legally? I mean, either at a game or practices, you expect him to you know, we're working through that. Um, right now, our focus is to make sure that he's uh, in a healthy environment. Academically, he's doing great. He's a part of everything that, that we're doing on the court and between our university and athletic department. Uh, when that time comes, you know, there'll be uh, certainly some disciplinary action. Did you see that type of shooting prowess out of Marcelo when you were recruiting him? Yes. Last year, too? Mm-hmm. Last year, what makes you think that he can stay in and have a much better sophomore year? You know, last year we had a talented starting five. Uh, not only a talented group, but a, a very experienced group. You know, you forget that Dusan and Parker 
when their career ended. They were the all-time winningest player in the history of the school and the second all-time winningest player in the history of the school. And I think the only reason Parker didn't have more wins is you know, he had a couple setbacks injury-wise or else I mean, he would have had even more. So you know, those are two sometimes that you take for granted, but those guys were a part of some great moments and were two of the most experienced players uh, maybe that played college basketball last year. You, know, you throw in uh, Alonzo, DeAndre, and Raleigh, that's a good group of guys. And uh, so I don't, I don't think it's uh, a negative light at all that Alex didn't play more. And for that matter, there are a number of guys in Alex's situation. We tried to put our best team on the court, and it was a combination of talent and experience. But when you're on a team like that, even though you don't shine in games, you really can uh, thrive in practice, and you can grow. And sometimes it's subtle. Sometimes it happens over a long period of time, but you know Alex has had a good summer, as a lot of our guys have, and I think he's eager to have a bigger role. John, who can you count on defensively? Maybe a guy on the perimeter and someone a big you can funnel into that you've seen so far. You know that's what I don't have the answer to. You know last year uh, that was our struggle. You know we uh, we had a lot of success, but uh, when we lost. You know, the games that we lost, whether they were in November or, uh, or the last game of the year to Buffalo, where we would struggle the most would be on the defensive end. And uh, a lot of those guys who played the most minutes, they're no longer with us. But I, I think that's really a sign of more of, of a program, of our teams. And, you know, you never want to be, you know, a top 20, a top 10. At one point, we were one of the top five defensive teams in the country. And I think in last year, um, we slipped into maybe the 80s. So forget who's going to be that player. I think our quest as a coaching staff and as a program is is to really work and, and improve and be the best defensive team we can be. But like always, um, you know, the players that win the most games, usually they do it on both ends of the court, not just one end. And, you know, last year I think some of what we went through was it's so hard in today's world of college basketball to play two seven-footers. And... Um, you know, when, when you have smaller groups, it's you have an advantage sometimes on, on the glass or maybe on, on offense with the way those two guys played. But defensively, it's quite a challenge. And I think DeAndre in particular, he'll benefit now that he's left us because he had to do so many different things as a seven-footer, a freshman a year ago defensively. But we're more traditional this year. And, uh, you know, and I hope that we can get some benefits because of that. Certainly... Uh, we don't have the height, the size, the rebounding, but maybe we can make up for it with uh, able to match up better on the perimeter, and we'll see. I don't have the answer to that yet. Yeah, Sean, I think I asked you this question earlier. With you in transition, maybe because you don't have the height, and you have a lot of six, seven guys, that's you'd be able to run more, be faster on the perimeter, and just in the transition game. Yeah, I mean, we, we try to run as much as we can, um, especially off of misses, you know, on makes. You know, it's, it's tough to shoot quick and win on the road. You know, I, I think a quick shot has to be a great shot. Um, and a lot of times pace of play is dictated not by when you have the ball, but it's when you don't have the ball. You know, if, if we're picking up full court, if we're denying passing lanes, if we're, you know, trapping and doing that, that leads to the other team shooting quicker and all of a sudden scoring and the pace of play is up. You know, for us, uh, we want to be good on both ends, but no question. I think there's going to be more space on the court. You know, we've been playing two bigs um, and really moving forward. I think to have more ball handling, more skill on the court, and maybe one true big is, is maybe the route that we're moving. If that makes us play a little faster, then, then so be it. Coach, uh, to my knowledge, you haven't had a grad transfer since Ryan Tollison. Um, can you kind of take us through what it was like to go after Luther and Coleman and get them to come to Arizona? Well, they have a, they have a really, I think, big opportunity here. Um, one of the keys when you, when you have uh, the opportunity to, to get a grant, grad transfer and welcome them into your program, you know, you want to have a role for them because they only have one year. And in both of their cases, they do. They have the opportunity to have big roles. The thing that I like about both of those guys is, uh, you know, they're not necessarily running from the situation that they were in. I think they both, you know, obviously graduated. 
they both are very well thought of in the programs they come from. And I think this is a change and an opportunity that makes sense for them. Whether I do or not, that's the reality. What did you learn most about your team through the summer workouts? You know, that we have so many new faces. Uh, when you name a drill, when you're going through things for the first time, uh, it's, it's clearly the first time as a group. And, you know, the experience in college basketball can be somewhat understated. You know, you want to have talent. Sometimes, as was the case last year, when you have somebody like a DeAndre or even a year earlier, Lowry Markinen, you know, they're some of the best players in college basketball and, the, and they're young. But experience is still a big deal. And uh, that's something that in some ways we don't have experience within the framework of our own program. But like I pointed out at the beginning, one of the, uh, the hopes for us is to just welcome a, a couple of new players that are, decept are deceptively experienced. You know, they may not have experience playing for Arizona, but Chase Jeter, you know, Ryan Luther, and Justin Coleman, you know, they, they have an opportunity to uh, bring their experience as a college basketball player to our group. And when they learn our terminology and they practice more and they get into uh, things in the month of October and November, I think it'll be easier for them to, to lead the group. How quickly do you expect Brandon Williams to be a contributor on offense? You know, Brandon um, is a talented uh, young player, freshman. We, we were always going to play him at more than one position, and that's still the case. He could play the one, he could play the two, he can be a part of three guards. You know, when we had uh, maybe our best team that I've been a part of at Arizona, I don't, sometimes you don't realize how, how many minutes Gabe York, Nick Johnson, and TJ McConnell played together. You know, looking back at that season, some of our best moments and when, the, when it was the moments of truth late in games, deep into the season, those three guys are on the court a lot together. And uh, that's kind of the route we're moving, not only this year, but, but beyond. And I think Brandon is, is the type of player that can really thrive in that system. How much is with the Suns? I know read a couple of things that Igor Kokoshko, their new coach, wants to talk to you and he's excited to, to pick your brain about DeAndre. How much has that been going on and, and what can you kind of help them get used to DeAndre with? You know, I've, I've talked to Igor and, and the Suns uh, a number of times through the draft process and then, you know, really over the summer. Um, I think it's, it's smart for Igor to learn as much as he can about DeAndre and, and he's done a, a terrific job in, in seeking that information out. I, I talked to him about meeting with him and going and still might be able to see training camp. But, uh, you know, obviously I had my hands full here with our own team and the recruiting. And as much as I would have liked to have gone up there more, uh, I haven't been able to make it up there yet. But uh, I've told DeAndre I'm going to try to catch a training camp uh, practice or one of these early season exhibition games. And I'm sure when I do that, I'll have a chance to visit with him. But I think they're building something special. And uh, you know, Igor is a really impressive coach, um, unbelievable basketball mind. And I think that DeAndre's uh, in good hands. So what changes the first full practice? It, it, does it, I mean, like you said, you, there's so much going on in the off season. Does it really change much yesterday when you go out there for, what, three hours or two and a half? I mean, no, it changes more. The intensity, no matter how, how hard you try to, to, to keep it high uh, in the off season, you have to be smart. I mean, four hours is, is clearly a big step of giving you more familiarity and time with your players. But you know, it's nothing like real practice when you're practicing four, five, six days a week and you have a chance to, uh, to have you know, 20 hours. So it's just longer. It's more competitive. And uh, I think there's just more at stake in terms of the development of your team and I think the competitiveness. And, uh, you know, a few years ago, October 15th or October 12th, that was the date that college basketball started. And, you know, we really tried to make September 30th, you know, October 1st. That's the new beginning. So although we've done a lot of different things in the off offseason, um, there is a real distinct difference between yesterday's practice and the off season. You meant, uh, you, you've mentioned, of course, that uh, you've got some guys, particularly in the front court, with injury history. And I think you said you were 
kind of going easy on Ryan there early this summer? Are all, any of those guys kind of taking it easy still or sitting out at times, or, or how have you been in your life? No, I mean, we're not really trying to encourage them to, to take it easy. We're just trying to be as smart as we can. You know, we don't have a lot of depth up front. Uh, it's one of the big differences coaching this year's team. And we've had really, I guess, from year four for me, that goes a long, long time ago, I know. And that's been one of the strengths of our team. And as we've sustained different injuries, we've always had, you know, a lot of front court depth and versatility. This year, that, that's what you worry about, both in foul trouble and injuries. But we're going to be as smart as we can and prepare those guys as, as best we can. You know, they all have single digit body fat, which is quite a testament to, to Chase, Ryan, and Ira. They all have different builds, but that's the one thing you can control when, you, when you're talking about injuries, especially as a basketball player. It's to be as big and strong as you can be. And I think when you start talking about guys having 6% body fat, 8 9% body fat, you know, that, that gives them the best chance to be as healthy as we can. And, you know, I rely a lot on Justin Kukoski and Chris Rounds that if we start getting into uh, some overuse, you know, we can always pull back and uh, be as smart as we can. But, you know, that, that's how we have to be with those guys to, to get them from start to finish. And, you know, you need good fortune as well. It's been fun just to be out there for full practice after it seemed like between the spring, the 18 kids you're getting in, and the 19s you've been going after, you've been doing as much recruiting, if not more than ever. And I wonder if it felt different just to at least for a few hours put that behind you and get out there. No, it's, it's always nice. It's, uh, it's, I think, what makes you, which makes you tick as a player or a coach is, is practice. You know, when, when you're, you're teaching guys, you're competing against each other, you're playing a sport that you love. And obviously, there's a bottom line of having success, winning and losing. But I think the development of players and teams is maybe the funnest part for, uh, for all of us that are a part of college basketball. That said, you must love the competition among each other because they're all very good and they get better that way. You must love that part of it. I do. And, you know, we've had competition now for so many years. Um, we try to make our practices into a highly competitive environment. And we talk a lot about it. And uh, we challenge our guys to compete and, and get ready for, for games. You know, you just, you don't wave that magic wand and on game day, all of a sudden you're different. You know, you try to prepare as best you can for everything, but mostly the intensity of, of what a game requires. And how you do that is, is, you know, the environment you create every day. And we have over 100 practices and that's the difference between college basketball and maybe the NBA or, or a G League affiliate. You know, you, you're around your guys quite a bit in the practice environment. And then you add on the summer, the fall, the spring with more access. You know, you can really, really have a chance to make, make these guys better players. Coach, have you talked to DeAndre Alonzo or uh, Raleigh a lot this summer? Uh, and. and how, especially with the two that went undrafted, did you kind of guide them through their signing process, or did you play a role in that at all? Yeah, I talked to those guys uh, quite a bit, you know, I think by today's standards. Um, you know, they're in, in different situations, but you know, I was really disappointed for both Raleigh and Alonzo that they didn't hear their name called on draft night. But I will tell you that, respective to both of their situations, I think the organization that they're with right now really values both of them as players. I think as they've been around them throughout the summer and now training camp, that they value them perhaps even more. And there's a lot of ways to make the NBA. You know, there's those who hear their name called on draft night, but especially second round picks that, that never come close to making an NBA roster. And then you have those like Alonzo and Raleigh that, you know, they may make themselves into some really good long-term NBA players. I wouldn't be surprised in either case. Matter of fact, I would be surprised if they didn't have an NBA career. But they'll, they'll make their way. They've been through a lot. They've played at the highest level. They believe in their ability. And you know, I think both guys will continue to grow and get better. That's the one point. You know, When you leave school as early as these guys leave, you have a bigger upside to improve. And both of them love the game of basketball. And I would fully expect both to uh, to continue to develop and improve and and uh, go on and, and make a lot of money playing the game as a professional. In DeAndre's case, he's a number one pick, 
but um, he's a different number one pick. And he's going to, uh, in my mind, take the NBA by storm in large part because he's uh, incredibly intelligent. He is a very smart guy off the court, and he's a very smart guy on the court. He picks things up quickly and learns. And uh, I know the, the, the staff in Phoenix already sees that about him. And uh, when you're both as talented as he is and also uh, as tel intelligent as he is, you know, the sky's the limit for him. The Bulls, and you see Lowry and uh, Raleigh playing on the same team in the NBA together. Well, I hope that's the case. You know, um, Lowry got injured, so he's going to miss, I think, the first uh, month and a half of the season. But you know, a lot of people don't realize. You know, he made. I guess he was the fastest player in the history of the NBA to make a hundred three-point shots, and that's Larry Bird, Chris Mullen, Steph Curry. You know, not not a seven-footer, but the fastest player, which is quite a testament to, I think, how good of a player he'll be and already is in the NBA. You went through a lot when ESPN accused uh, you of a pay-for-play with Aiden. Do you feel like all that's behind you, or is there still some cloud hanging over somewhere? You know, I made my statement a year ago about that, and I'd ask you to reflect back to that statement. How much attention will you pay to New York as the bribery trials get underway? Same answer. Mention you and DeAndre is I mentioned they mentioned a whole laundry list of names that could come up and they mentioned you too and so I wondered even if that was a reaction you had to any of that. I made my statement last year and you can look back on that statement. What are your thoughts on ESPN using your photo as their head photo um, in an article today as a, a year after kind of recap that didn't totally didn't really name you or Arizona um, as a main piece? Same answer. What have you seen from Omar so far, and what do you kind of think this role is going to be? You know, Omar is um, a great kid, and, you know, he's really in a transition from FIBA basketball and, and playing in Europe to college basketball at a high level. I think the best years are ahead of him, and I think he's more of a development, developmental player, you know, development being at the forefront of what we're trying to, to uh, do with him. And we're excited to have him as part of our program. What is that transition like going from FIBA to college? You know, it's different for every one of these guys. And the one thing about the FIBA is it's a faster game. It's a 24-second shot clock. Uh, I think it exemplifies the NBA more so than college. Although the three-point line isn't as far back as the NBA, it is further back. There's more space on the court. Um, but other than that, it really depends on who we're talking about. You know, the transition for Dusan as a seven-foot center from Serbia was different than the transition for Lowry, for example. And, you know, and Omar isn't as far along as those two guys, plays a different position. So I think that in each of their cases, uh, it's certainly an adjustment. What's the recruiting process like for a European kid? Do you travel, did you travel to Belgium to talk to uh, Omar, or how, how did that uh, play out? I didn't. Um, it's no different than recruiting a high school prospect or a junior college prospect in the United States. Every one of their situations is, is new. It's different. You can't compare. And just like uh, my family is different than your family, we're, we grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania is going to be different than growing up in Dallas, Texas. So it's really hard to compare situations. And I think just in recruiting in general, you try to get to know the people as best you can. What, what about, uh, you mentioned as far as like uh, the point guard and, and you referenced possibly going three guards. Is Justin still kind of jump out as maybe the truest point guard of that bunch? Or what, what, what kind of do you see as you've been working with these guys, the skills you're getting with him and Brandon and, um, you know, Alex as far as who might be on the ball as much? Well, the difference between the three of them is Justin Coleman, like Parker, he only plays the point guard. So when he's in the game, he'll be the point guard. Um, with Alex and Brandon, and those are really the two others that play it, um, they don't have to be in the game and be the point guard. They, they can be, you know, off the ball with Justin or each other. So, um, you know, in Brandon's case, he's a dynamic playmaker, scorer. Uh, he's, you know, very athletic in transition. 
I think his shot is continuing to develop, but he can score. And I've already talked about Alex. You know, maybe the best thing that he does is, sh is shoot the ball. So uh, with that in mind, you know, and us having a different group, putting him off the ball makes a lot of sense. And, you know, the other player that I didn't talk about is Dylan Smith. And, you know, Dylan is unique to our team as well because, you know, I, I put him in both categories. You know, first category, it's, it's the Ryan Luther and Justin Coleman, Chase Jeter category in that he's more experienced than you realize. You know, he transferred, he sat out, played last year. He's now in his fourth year. So although he returns to a bigger role, you know, he's older. He's been through more seasons than a typical freshman. And, uh, you know, Dylan gained some valuable experience last year. And I, I think like some of the guys that I had mentioned, he's worked really hard this summer to be an improved, better player. So he gives us depth off the ball, playing the two and the three. And you could see the way our team is constructed. We have a lot of wings and a lot of guards. And, you know, it's up to us to, to make that work. How does, uh, how does ACOT, you talk about the wings and the guards, how does ACOT fit in? Is he a guy who can play up? Yeah, you know, Emmanuel, and even when we recruited him, you know, a couple years ago, we always envisioned him as he grew within our program. A lot like Solomon Hill and Rondé um, did, you know, you, you could play them sometimes at the four position. And, you you know, you look at how the game's changed. It's completely different now than when Solomon played here. And Solomon is a great example that, you know, he was always on a quest to be a, a wing, a perimeter player, because when he left college at that point, the NBA was welcoming him into a, a, a league where it was very position specific. You know, certain height, you played this position. If you weren't big enough, you had to play that position. Well, as you guys know, it's really changed a lot. Solomon, if you watch him as an NBA player, he probably plays the four more than any other spot. So I look at Emmanuel as, and I compare Emmanuel to Solomon a lot because they both have great instincts. They, they're like playmakers, and yet they're not a point guard. Uh, both guys had to improve as a shooter. And when Solomon left here, he was uh, about a 40% three-point shooter. His first year, he was four for 16 from three on the season. If you think of Emmanuel as a freshman and uh, maybe where he'll be this year and moving forward, uh, improving his shooting is something he's working hard to do. But he also brings a number of other things to uh, to our team that will be valuable. But I would say that he... When you think of our front line, you would want to include him because he's almost like the fourth front court player when you consider how much he could play at the four. You talked about Emmanuel Acott a lot last year as your guys' kind of defensive leader. Is that still the case? And how has Emmanuel Acott uh, developed and progressed as a player from a year ago this time? You know, we hope so. Um, we're just so young and early on right now. Um, you, you learn a number of things in the summer, but you're really trying to improve more. Right now, I think from this point towards the end of October, and then when we get into November, we'll know more. But I believe he has a lot of ability to be a good defensive player. He's, uh, he knows our system a lot more now than he did as a freshman. And You know, there's a number of things we really do in the off season, and one of the things we pride ourselves in is our strength and conditioning program. And uh, Emmanuel bench pressed 185 pounds 18 times. And for somebody who has as long of arms as he has, you know, that's an exercise that favors the short-armed guy. So for him to have as long of arms as he does and be as young as he is, I think to be able to push 185 pounds 18 times shows you that he's worked hard in the weight room, and, and that will serve him well. You know, Ryan Luther broke our record in the same exercise, and again, he's not a freshman, he's a senior. He's been through a lot. He's older, he's stronger. But he bench pressed 185, uh, 25 times, which is our record. So, you know, we're welcoming in a new player that uh, I think can bring some things to the table to help us, strength and experience. And uh, I, I believe that same thing's true for Justin Coleman and Chase Jeter as well. Brandon Randall came close to uh, Nick Johnson on the, the vertical jump. Did, did that yeah. surprise you? And how is he doing, by the way, at this point? No, Brandon has a lot of talent, and uh, he's worked hard over the summer like all these guys have. You know, one of the things that we have going for us is, you know, there's a big carrot for each one of our players. You know, they have an opportunity 
and they have an opportunity to have a bigger role or a starting role. And when you have that sitting there, they they go for it. And you know, you've noticed uh, if you're part of our our program as far back as early spring throughout the summer and fall, those guys that were here a year ago that didn't play maybe as much or have as big of a role, they're hungry to have a bigger role. You know, how that works out is yet to be determined, but I can only judge those guys on how hard they've worked. And, you know, the attitude of this group and I think the collective work ethic has been uh, tremendous. What's your bench press record before Brian broke it? 23. Um, Talbot Denny, and Talbot is a beneficiary of short arms and a lot of strength. But the guys that do the best in the bench press, I think other than Nick Johnson, would be those guys that you could almost predict. They're older, they're big, they're strong, they're physical. And, you know, Ryan is, is like that. Um, that's why I, I pointed out Emmanuel for him to, to do 18 on that exercise, I think shows you how hard he's worked. What's your early thoughts on just uh, the Pac-12 and how, who might be up there and, and where, where do you guys think you might be able to fit in? You know, I think Oregon stands out. Uh, they have a lot of uh, talent, both coming in but also returning. Uh, Dane Altman is, I think, one of college basketball's best coaches. Uh, we've had some great battles with them. When we've been at our best, it always seems like, you know, they're a team that's very difficult to, de to defeat. They improve as the year goes on. And I think the combination of their freshmen plus uh, their, their returners really uh, puts them at the, at the class of our conference. But there's a number of programs that I think will be very good. USC, Colorado, UCLA, and, you know, Arizona State, Stanford, I mean, so, you know, hopefully this is a, a, a year where a number of teams improve. Washington, for example, based on their experience, um, how difficult their zone defense is to prepare for. And a lot of, I think, the players a year ago that thrived in their, in their system, they're returning a year older, which is always, I think, uh, something that, that we, uh, we as coaches would love to have. And I think they have a lot of that. So... I think there's a number of teams that will be will be difficult and, and improved. Utah's obviously very well coached, always a difficult place to play. And you know, from one year to the next, Larry does a great job. How many um just curious about recruiting, how many guys do you plan to sign in general or hope to sign this fall or do you expect a lot of guys will wait till the spring too? Well, we've had 10 recruiting classes, and uh, we've signed 52 players to the National Letter of Intent. That's a lot of uh, information there. So if I'm a predictor, I would say that, you know, in the 11th recruiting class, which is the one we're currently in, you know, we'll give or take probably bring in five or six. Yeah, three or four this fall, who knows? Or, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks.